This webinar is on examining hip anatomy and structure with point of care ultrasound, the posterior hip. This is part four of a four part series on the hip and you may view recordings of the rest of the series on this website listed up here. Before we begin, please be advised all attendees are muted. You may type your questions into the Q&A box in the toolbar located at the bottom of your screen at any time. We will conduct a Q&A session at the end of the presentation and demonstration. This webinar will be recorded and archived for future reference as well. Our presenters today are Daniel Shelton and Bill Medford. Daniel Shelton is the Director of Musculoskeletal Market Development for Fujifilm Sonosite. Daniel spent 16 years as a dedicated musculoskeletal sonographer and 10 of those years have been here at Sonosite. He now leads musculoskeletal market development where he works to spread the word about the benefits of point of care ultrasound. Bill Medford is the lead musculoskeletal specialist for Fujifilm Sonosite. With 40 years of experience as a sonographer, including 22 years specializing in musculoskeletal sonography, Bill is an expert in using point of care ultrasound across the breadth of mus musculoskeletal specialties. Bill, I will turn it over to you to get started. Well, thank you, Laura, and welcome to everybody to the final uh, presentation in our posterior hip webinar series. Um, and with that, we'll move along. Today, what you're going to see are images produced off of the Sonosite PX, uh, newly launched uh, about six months ago. The PX office, uh, PX offers unmatched image clarity and a system design that will be found to be very adaptable um, uh, in examination rooms. Transducers uh, cover the full breadth of transducers that you're used to seeing with Sonosite products. Transducers that you'll you see utilized today include the linear 15 to four megahertz transducer as well as the curved five to one megahertz transducer. Also, when we're doing, looking at structures with, that have su um, anatomy that's very superficial, uh, we want to use a higher frequency probe and our linear 19 to five megahertz transducer offers the highest frequency ever developed um, with Sonosite products and uh, results in exceptional ex uh, image clarity. We won't have any demonstrations of that today, but for any superficial imaging, certainly a transducer to consider. The anatomy that we will be covering today include the SI joint, the gluteus maximus, piriformis, quadratus femoris, the hamstring complex, as well as the sciatic nerve. Bony acoustic landmarks, always our starting point in identifying anatomy, include the posterior superior iliac spine, the sacroiliac joint, the dorsal iliac wing, the sacral foramina, the greater sciatic foramen, and the ischial tuberosity. Let's start with the SI joint. The SI joint is a diarthrodial joint. Its sacral surface is covered with hyaline cartilage and the iliac surface is lined with fibrocartilage. It is smooth in the young and becomes irregular with age. It can become unstable due to ligamentous injury or laxity, which can result in instability and discomfort. Ultrasound can be the procedure of choice for therapeutic injection. We begin our examination at the posterior superior iliac spine with the transducer placed in a transverse body plane at the level of the PSIS, either identifiable on the image or by palpation. Once we've identified the PSIS, we're going to move the transducer distally until we get this wider portion of the SI joint, which we see on this sonographic image. And then we'll want to move the transducer even a little bit more distal to recognize this narrower point 
of the SI joint. Note that when we're more proximal that the iliac side has a steeper contour down to this wider joint as opposed to when we're more distally, the iliac side is more flattened and we see that the joint is narrower. Injections can be delivered at any location. Some feel that the injection, therapeutic injection is more effectively delivered at this narrower place where up above in the wider portion of the SI joint, there are more ligamentous constraints and it's felt that the delivery of injections may not be as effective in, in sliding down into this narrower portion of the joint space. A needle is guided from medial to lateral in plane when we're doing injection guidance procedures under ultrasound of the sacroiliac joint. The gluteus maximus we covered in our lateral hip, but it is a posterior structure, but it becomes a lateral insertion. So we're covering at both places. The gluteus maximus is the primary extensor muscle of the hip. It also assists with external rotation and abduction. It is the largest and most superficial of the gluteal complex and is innervated by the inferior gluteal nerve. Its origin is along the posterior aspect of the dorsal ilium and along the lateral aspect uh, and posterior lateral aspect of the sacrum. It will also blend with the lumbar fascia and the sacrotuberous ligament. Along with the tensor fascia lata, its connection to the IT band stabilizes the femur along the surface of the tibia while standing during relaxation of the extensor, extensors, ultimately to insert on, on Gertie's tubercle of the tibia. A more proximal point of insertion is along the gluteal tuberosity of the femur. Daniel, I'll turn it over to you to demonstrate the SI joint and gluteus maximus. All right, thank you, Bill. I am gonna wait on that to go full screen. There we are. Thanks for joining us again today. Um, in front of me, I've got a Sonosite PX and our live model here. Uh, just to orient everybody, because you're going to see a few different camera angles, uh, we've got proximal um, this way, which maybe I'll be doing the right hip. They're laying down um, on their belly. So proximal, distal is this way. And then um, from our upper camera angle, I've labeled in the corners up here, uh, proximal and distal. And then you can see the same camera on the bottom. So I know when we're when we're zoomed in here, um, it can be a little bit disorienting, but I do want to kind of point that out ahead of time so that everybody's familiar with what we're uh, viewing here. So we've got proximal this way, distal this way, and then just like we do in all the other hip and pelvis um, uh, courses, I do want to talk a little bit about patient modesty here. Uh, this is the posterior hip. This is no exception. Uh, so what I've got is two blankets here that I'll be scanning kind of through a window that I open up. I've already tucked the blanket into the upper part of the um, pants because we're gonna be right up here on the SI joint and working our way inferiorly. So for this first part of the presentation, I'm coming from the top side down and I've got the shorts pulled down here and they are tucked in here. Um, I've got this second blanket here just to expose the upper part of the hip there. So our, our um, ilium, being here and sacrum being here, I can I can palpate that PSIS, which will be the beginning of our examination. Gonna have a little bit of gel here. Again, this is the 15 to 4 L154 transducer. Um, I want to spin the transducer around. I have the orientation marker facing medial or to the midline, and I just went ahead and maybe by luck uh, plopped down right on the PSIS. That may not always happen, so if it doesn't. Let's talk about going and finding that, that uh, more superficial bony landmark. So if you just set the transducer down and, and, and you're kind of wondering where you might be, uh, we need to find a bony prominence, okay? And if it's this with the slope on it, this is the ilium here. And what we're gonna do is just follow that ilium up high, 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 
until it meets its most peak. And then I'm going to go proximal to distal to find the, the absolute apex of that thing right there. Now, if you start more midline, you may catch this flat plate of the sacrum and the spine of the sacrum. So um, here's one of the spinous processes of the sacrum here. And we're just going to follow that down laterally. Now, don't stumble on the first thing that looks like a joint. Um, those are just sacral foramen. This could be uh, S2 or S1, depending on how proximal I am. But I need to go even more lateral until we see that high riding bony peak of the PSIS. So what I'm doing there is I'm, I'm planting the medial side of the transducer with a finger like I did in a lot of other body parts like the elbow where we pivot and windshield wiper. And I'm just going to be moving my thumb across this way until I see that PSIS really nice. And what that does is it, it really nicely opens the joint for the upper SI joint or the superior SI joint. And you can even see the anisotropic artifact of these ligaments here. So that, that lets you know that we're in the ballpark. And as Bill mentioned, if we're coming in for an injection, it's going to be from midline to lateral this way. Now let's follow that joint, the PSIS being easier to follow, inferiorly. We're going to follow that inferiorly, inferiorly, inferiorly until it completely disappears into the superior sciatic foramen, which would be here, and the piriformis is down here, which we'll get to. But that tells me that I've gone beneath the inferior SI joint, which is right here. You can see that joint really nicely right there. Not this space, right here. So this is the most inferior margin of the ilium. And if I drop my thumb inferiorly, you'll see it disappear completely. And the sacrum remains. So right here is that sacroiliac joint. And you can see the joint really nicely on this on a site PX. Superficial to that. These are the fibers of the glute max. They're oblique. They dive this way. So they're crossing my transducer obliquely. And you can see them jumping up and over to dive onto the sacrum here. So what I'm going to do, I know that they slant this way to wrap over the troch. So I'm just going to pivot the transducer this way until we elongate the muscle fibers of the glute max. And it's a very broad muscle. I can follow it right across the ilium. And it's not necessarily a part of an examination protocol um, on the posterior hip, even though the more applications we find to do ultrasound on the hip, especially the posterior hip, the more it may become somebody's protocol. But if clinically indicated, you would want to chase these, the, the, the origin of these fibers. Um, you can actually see the uh, glute max jump up and over the sacrum here to that lumbar fascia that Bill mentioned right there, that little feathery edge. So that's pretty neat. I'm going to go even more inferior, more inferior, more inferior until we see the glute max really tapered up onto what looks like the spine of the sacrum. And we're actually down here at the uh, caudal epidural anatomy. So that's actually the uh, sacral cornu that we're seeing here. Maybe for a different subject in pain management or something, we'll go over the caudal epidural anatomy. But following that glute max, laterally, 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 you can see how nice and parallel the fibers are. And I'm sure Bill will mention uh, when we get to piriformis, which is right here, um, just how nice and parallel they are to each other. Bill, did I miss anything so far? And while Bill unmutes, I'll, I'll keep scanning that glute max. I'm going to add a little bit of gel, getting a little dry. There we go. Daniel, I'm back on the PowerPoint now. All right. Go ahead, Bill. Okay. Let's move to the piriformis. Uh, Daniel mentioned that piriformis fibers do parallel the fibers of the overlying gluteus maximus. And the piriformis uh, courses like the G-max diagonally. Its origin is on the anterior sacrum, specifically three bundle attachments between the first and second, second and third, and third and fourth anterior sacral foramina. It exits through the greater sciatic foramen and inserts onto the superior aspect of the greater trochanter. Also, to uh, be aware of is the sciatic nerve as it comes out 
from what is behind the piriformis muscle to cross over in front of the gemelli and obturators and ultimately the quadratus femoris. 17% of sciatic nerves, however, run through the piriformis and predisposes this subgroup to tingling, numbness, and pain along the sciatic nerve and deep into the buttocks. So where do we begin when we look for the, um, look for the piriformis muscle? We're going to begin at the PSIS and our transducer is going to, as where we started with the SI joint, is going to be placed at the PSIS. Our next transducer movement is going to slide laterally with the lateral aspect of the transducer toed in. We're going to employ the heel toe maneuver, this being the heel, this being the toe. We're going to toe in to, to level out this iliac wing so that uh, we have a, a continuous appearance of bone on the undersurface of what here is gluteus medius. Once we have established that, we're going to slide the transducer distally and oblique the transducer to correspond with the diagonal course of the piriformis. So directly transverse up here to demonstrate the iliac wing, slide down until we lose that continuous iliac wing and begin to see the sciatic foramen. Once we lose that bit of bone up here and we come to uh, the uh, sciatic foramen, we begin to see once we oblique the transducer along the diagonal course, we'll begin to see the piriformis. Adjacent anatomy that might help us identify this is again, the sciatic nerve and the superior gluteal nerve and the associated vessels in particular uh, might turn on color Doppler and recognize the inferior gluteal, nerve, uh, gluteal artery here. So the sonographic appearance um, is Again, fibers very parallel to one another, G-max, piriformis, and we can use a dynamic maneuver by flexing the knee and rotating the femur to see translation of the piriformis back and forth. I'm sure Daniel will be demonstrating that in our live scanning. Moving a little further south, we'll go from the piriformis, we'll cross over the gemelli and the obturators to the quadratus femoris. Quadratus femoris is an external rotator and adductor of the thigh. It also assists in stabilizing the hip joint. Its origin is at the lateral margin of the obturator ring. And um, and uh, I, I'm sorry, its lateral margin is at the obturator ring, just superior to the ischial tuberosity, which is where we'll find the uh, hamstrings inserts. Its uh, distal insertion is on the quadrate tubercle and the intertrochanteric crest of the posterior uh, medial femur, right along here and here on the sonographic image. So this is the quadratus femoris. Where do we begin? We place the transducer at or near the gluteal fold where we'll recognize the bony acoustic landmark of the ischial tuberosity. Medially and laterally, we'll recognize the femur. Quadratus femoris bridges that gap. This is the ischial femoral space and is a zone of impingement of the overlying sciatic nerve. Dynamic maneuvers can help um, us recognize snapping that may occur due to a lessening of this distance and snapping um, at the ischiofemoral space. 
Okay, Daniel, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Bill. Um, as Bill mentioned, we're going to go um, inferiorly on the hip now, and I've redraped the hip. We're still proximal this way, but I've got the shorts um, now up, and I've I've taken the time to tuck and protect the uh, the patient's undergarments. And then what we're going to do is just expose um, down to the gluteal fold. So what we're going to be looking at now is the inferior SI joint, and we're going to walk our way to the ilium, and then we're going to go south into that superior sciatic foramen, and that will help us find the piriformis. So left side of the screen again is going to be medial, and we're looking for a bony landmark there. So let's find out which part of the, uh, the inferior SI joint that is. It looks like I fell right on it. Um, so what we're going to do is follow this ilium now. Let's follow the ilium laterally, laterally, laterally. There we go. And all I'm going to do is just fall into that superior sciatic notch. So it's just a little short movement. And I can already tell I'm in that ballpark because I can see that superior gluteal artery just resting right here. And what we're going to do is throw our color feature on. And I want to be able to see that little artery. And what that's doing is just a clue to say, hey, I'm about to hit the superior sciatic foramen. And you're going to see that that artery start to shoot straight up and down, headed towards my transducer as it wraps up and around the inferior margin of the ilium. So the very, very next structure underneath that um, is going to be our piriformis here. So um, diagnostically, L15, great transducer to look at all these little fibers. And I can see this big pizza slice headed laterally over the ischium. So here we have ischium piriformis, inferior gluteal artery, superior gluteal artery. And I think the, uh, I always relate things to food for some reason. So I do, I think the piriformis just looks like a big pizza slice. It's a triangular shape uh, structure. It's going to go up and over the ischium. As Bill mentioned, uh, we start to see the superior gemella right here as it rests right on top of there. And then just before we get to the ischium down here, we've got that sciatic nerve or at this point could be the distal lumbar complex still, but here it is as a nice tight uh, group of nerve. Uh, so it's probably already sciatic at this point, um, but this is nerve. And then up over the ischium is the superior gemella. And then just resting on top of that superior gemella, if I keep going laterally, is the uh, piriformis muscle. And this thin strand is starting to make itself into the piriformis tendon. Um, procedurally and dynamically, I like to switch over to the curvilinear probe. So I'm going to take a second to do that. I'm going to select the C51 transducer with a musculoskeletal exam type to get a broader field of view. And if your general patient population is not of the body habitus of our model today, you're really going to want to consider getting a curvilinear probe. So I'm starting with the left side of the screen again to the patient's um, medial side. Things are going to look a little bit different. Uh, so I want to go find a familiar landmark. So what I have to do is find my inferior SI joint or any of the part of the sacrum is fine and then move the probe laterally to the ilium. So here, this big ski slope here is the ilium, the inferior part of that slope. I'm aiming the beam all the way to the anterior pelvis actually. So here's minimus, medius, maximus. Uh, so just to give you an idea of the broad field of view that we get with the uh, C51 transducer, it's really nice just to get you oriented. So let's follow the ilium now south. And I need to see the ilium split into two pieces. There. So left side of the screen, sacrum side of the screen, I see this opening, but I still see two bony landmarks. So sacrum here and the beginnings of the ischium here. Back to our pizza slice piriformis here. Um, if I wanted to check my work on the inferior part of the ilium, you can see that superior gluteal artery pulsating really nicely. Activate the color feature again. Check your work. Make sure you're still familiarizing yourself. But you can just see the more broad um, field of view that you get out of the curvilinear and more appreciation for the whole structure um, as that, that superior gluteal artery is just hugging the border of the piriformis there. Get my arrow back out here. So okay, this is the piriformis. Yeah, Bill, go ahead. Real quick, show how the angle of the transducer is because frequently um, the most, one of the most common mistakes I see, and I, I'm sure you do too, is that the transducer isn't oblique to go along the diagonal course of the piriformis. 
That's true, Bill. Um, I just kind of instinctively did that because I've just, I've just scanned so many of the hips. Um, but when you're first learning this, and I stumbled through a lot of things on the posterior hip, uh, it's kind of the final frontier on ter in terms of the joints that we typically cover for me. And I did find it useful to go ahead and elongate the glute max. Remember that those are running parallel to each other. And the glute max is such an oblique structure. We need to pivot our transducer and set ourselves up for the long axis of the piriformis. So there you can see, and I can palpate the troke to find out. So here's troke, and I'm aiming right at the troke. It's not a horizontal structure. It's a very much a vertically oriented oblique structure. So here we have glute, glute max, long axis, piriformis, long axis. And you can even see some of the central tendon of the piriformis starting to show itself here as we get over to the ischium. Um, superior ischium here, right on the upper margin of the ischium, here's our superior gemella. With more penetration out of a lower frequency transducer, you can very nicely see the inferior gluteal artery, the sciatic nerve. Down a little deeper, we get into some pudendal structures, maybe for a pain management talk we could get into. Uh, but for the general survey, we're going to keep following that piriformis out laterally. And we start to see that, that posterior um, uh, femoral acetabular joint here, neck of the femur, troke, starting to make itself known here. Um, I do see a lot of people struggle when they're looking for a piriformis. They start at the troke, and they call just any of these rotating structures a... Uh, a piriformis. Uh, when, when I was first learning to do posterior hip a while back, um, I made the miss call when doing external rotations and just looking for the troke here. And we call up, oh, there's our piriformis. And we got really excited. I'm going to bring the arrow to the spot that we got excited about. Saw a huge wavy flag tear right there. I mean, what else could that be? It's the big, uh, it, it's the big rotating muscle we see on the anatomy scan, and we sent it out for an MRI, and it came back as an, uh, uh, wouldn't you know, as a quadratus femoris tear. And that's when we really got to learn, hey, we need to take a little bit more time and start with our bony landmarks from the pelvis, from the ilium, work our way south from the superior sciatic notch where you know it originates on the anterior sacrum there. And so the two bones we have in the, in, the, in the view here, and I'm going to try to bring the leg where you can see me rotate, upper left is sacrum, mid-screen right is the ischium. And all I'm going to do is just rotate passively. Don't let the patient do it for you because it'll start activating all the, the surrounding gluteal structures and it'll move your transducer. Also, an angle consideration is not to stay per, just uh, perpendicular to the skin because these structures tend to dive away. Uh, when the patient is laying down, um, and you were looking, say, at a skeletal model, the, um, the ilium is not flat this way. The ilium is diving this way, like two plates, obliquely oriented. And what I need to do is aim into that big ilium wing this way, not this way. So I need to be 90 degrees to the ilium before I get down into the piriformis. So starting with our familiar bony landmarks again, we have our big... Ilium here, we can see glute max and mead, and I'm just going to fall into that superior sciatic notch. You can see the bones opening up right there, closing up. So I'm scanning superior, inferior, superior, inferior, and now I'm going to oblique the probe and go long axis there. And all I'm doing now is, is just confirming my location of the piriformis with the internal and external rotations passively. Got to do this passively, or it'll be a very uh, frustrating exam. Daniel, while you're there, we have a question, and we usually wait until we're finished. But while you're there, um, we have a request to see if you can show the sciatic nerve. Um, pause just a little bit and point it out uh, for people to see, please. You bet. Right here. See this triangular wedge resting against the ischium? So this is sciatic nerve. It's lateral to the arterial structures, of the inferior gluteal artery and the pudendal. And you could follow it down and watch it stay on the edge of the ischium and then jump up and over that neck of the ischium here. And we'll get into the remainder of the sciatic nerve when we get into quadratus femoris. But I'm still just following that sciatic nerve where my arrow is using, well, it gets lost in a little bit of anisotropy. Let's start right back up here again. There, there is where um, 
me go right back to where I was. So here's our piriformis. Sciatic is sitting just right here. And it's not just a centimeter or so of motion. You're going to see the sciatic nerve climb upwards there. And it is still subject to anisotropy, so I kind of kind of let it get away from me there. But here it is. It's a flat ribbon at this point over the ischium. So let's follow that, that nerve right here. I keep remembering to move my arrow. And more distally, it's really nicely, reliably found right here on top of the quadratus femoris as this little triangle. So screen left, we've got our ischial tuberosity and our hamstring origins. And then right here is the sciatic nerve. And then here's that quadratus femoris. And we could try to trace that proximally to see that little, see the anisotropic transition it's trying to make right there. So this is inferior gemella. Here it is on top of there. There's the sciatic what I'm having to do is rotate my probe and head back up towards the sacrum. And here's where it's still kind of a flat ribbon. I would say that I've found it helpful to go down to the quadratus femoris and the ischial yeah. tuberosity and identify it at that label and then follow it up to the yeah. piriformis. That's what I just, that's what I just did. And yep. it kind of highlighted that anisotropy, mm -hmm. but here it is trying to, trying to maintain that perpendicularity. But um, I'm, what I'm finding myself having to do is almost like a rainbow of the transducer to stay 90 degrees to the nerve as it curves up and over the ischium. So here it is, nerve, sciatic, 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 sciatic. Remain that uh, 90 degree relationship as I climb up and over. And I'll find myself uh, down at the quadratus. Oh, there it is. I think that's great, Daniel. One other, yep. one other thing. Um, sure. One more time. Could you demonstrate the dynamic, um, uh, dynamic uh, motion of the piriformis? Sure. So back to our familiar landmark. I'm going to lose the arrow for a minute because I need two hands. Um, come up here to the sacrum. And the big tip here is as you go laterally to aim back into the ilium. Okay, so we're aiming into the ilium, not 90 degrees to the skin, into the ilium. And we see that big ski slope of the ilium. And what I'm gonna do is just fall down, keeping the sacrum in the upper left portion of the screen. That would be one of my other scanning tips, um, pearls that I'm observing uh, while, I'm, while I'm sitting here talking to you guys. Sacrum, upper left, and I'm gonna watch this, this horizontal bony structure split into two pieces here. When I see those two pieces, I know I'm in the superior sciatic foramen. You're going to tilt the probe or uh, ro rotate it. In this case, I just went clockwise. And that opens up that big triangular uh, pizza slice shaped piriformis. And I'm going to confirm that just by doing passive rotations internally and externally. And I'm on the medial or yeah, more medial side of the ischium. And you can see this muscle, the more external rotation I apply, which would be internal rotation, I guess. I hope that answers their question. Very good. Thank you. We'll all share my yeah. screen and we'll uh, move on to the hamstrings. <clears throat> so the hamstrings originate from the ischial tuberosity. Uh, they, can, they contribute to um, assisting with hip extension and knee flexion as 
each of the hamstring muscles traverse the both the hip joint and the knee joint. There are three um, muscle tendon structures that comprise the um, the hamstrings: the semimembranosus muscle tendon, as well as the semitendinosus and long head of the biceps. The semimembranosus uh, muscle tendon group originates off the suprolateral ischial tuberosity and inserts onto the medial epicondyle. So the semimembranosus here comes underneath the semi T and the biceps to insert right here on the ischial tuberosity. And then it comes down and inserts on the medial tibial condyle. The semitendinosus and long head of the biceps are conjoined. Uh, the postural and they insert on the postural lateral ischial tuberosity as one point of um, origin. There are two heads to the bicep tendon, a long head and a short head proximally. The short head originates from the linea aspera of the femur. The, in, uh, the insertion of the bicep femoris is on the fibular head. And at this point, the long head and the short head have become uh, common tendon to um, insert um, as, as a single tendon onto the uh, fibular head. The semitendinosus, on the other hand, inserts on the anteromedial tibia as one of the pes serine tendons. All of the uh, hamstrings are innervated by the tibial branch of the sciatic nerve. So where do we begin? We begin again at the gluteal fold or near it, at which point we'll recognize the hyperechoic bony acoustic landmark of the ischial tuberosity shaped much like uh, a Matterhorn um, with a bony prominent peak over the, over the top of which we will see on the lateral uh, aspect, the conjoint tendon of the semi-T and the biceps femoris. Also just lateral as Daniel just covered nicely in his live demo, the sciatic nerve will be identified. If we turn the transducer 90 degrees now, and we look at these structures in the long axis, we'll see the ischial tuberosity. Superficial, we'll see the conjoint tendon. And deep to that, as we fall off the bone, we'll see the semimembranosus tendon. This, these are the tendon only portions of the hamstrings complex proximally. If we follow them more distally, we'll, we'll see and we'll want to interrogate the myotendinous junction. The biceps is the most commonly torn. The most common running tear is a musculotendinous tear that you only see, um, uh, that you frequently will see just immediately adjacent to the central tendon a little further distal from here. The sciatic nerve, we're going to begin uh, where Daniel demonstrated before. I like to interrogate it beginning at the piriformis. We're going to position our transducer along the piriformis so that again, we see the, the thicker portion of the piriformis, by the way, piriformis, the Latin for piriformis is pear-shaped as opposed to the pizza slice that you were talking about, Daniel. I must agree though, that it is shaped more like a pizza, a slice of pizza than a pear. But the piriformis, then we'll see the sciatic nerve and adjacent to it, the inferior gluteal artery. If we slide the transducer distally now, uh, past the gemelli and the obturators to the ischium, again, 
this is that same image where we see the ischial tuberosity, the conjoined tendon, and slightly lateral to it, we'll see the sciatic nerve. Always good when you're looking at the sciatic nerve at this level. See, this is we don't the depth of this image isn't set as, um, to image the quadratus femoris, but at this level, always wise to just look at the quadratus femoris. There are dynamic maneuvers that can be done to demonstrate ischiofemoral impingement and snapping that may occur due to that, um, and recognize. Uh, uh, decrease in space here that could contribute to irritation of the sciatic nerve. Once we move slightly more distal, we're going to be in the upper portion of the posterior thigh where we'll see the conjoined tendon and its myotendinous um, uh, component with the biceps femoris laterally, the semitendinosus medially, We'll see the typical tadpole shape of the semimembranosus tendon and the underlying semimembranosus muscle, so myotendinous junction. And laterally, we'll identify the sciatic nerve. That concludes the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. Daniel, I'll let you finish it up with a live model demonstration of those structures, please. All right. Thanks, Bill. So I've switched back over to the L15 linear 15 megahertz transducer. There we go. And I'm going to re-expose the hip back here and pick up where we left off. Uh, this time, my bony landmark is going to be the ischial tuberosity. And lateral, I should see that, that sciatic nerve really nicely. And to check my work, we'll look at the quadratus femoris again. Um, left side of the screen will be medial. And if, if you joined late, you can see in the upper corner, um, this is superior, this is inferior, this is lateral, this is medial here. So I'm gonna place the transducer down here where I believe I should find initial tuberosity. If I don't see one right off the bat, what I have to do is just follow these shadowing structures up more medially. Here we go. So let's find out which kind of bone this is. I'm going to follow it down and see if it, it comes to a nice point, and that's going to be our ischial tuberosity. I've run out of gel, so I'm just going to squeegee some gel down more inferiorly. There we are. So um, we've got this, this prominent bony peak here, um, just lateral to that prominent bony peak of the ischial tuberosity. We can see that conjoined tendon structure starting to show itself. Um, I'm going to keep moving laterally just to orient myself a bit more so here's quadratus femoris. Here's that sciatic nerve. So we can see all those structures really nice. So we know we're in the ballpark. We know where we need to be. Um, do now to differentiate these fibers. I'm going to bring my depth up because I can. We want a more shallow depth and a more high resolute image. And um, we're going to use anisotropic artifact to our advantage and kind of split apart these layers here. Daniel, so I'm going to interrupt yeah. just for a second. I know the image from your PX doesn't translate to the Zoom presentation perfectly. I'm going to have you just decrease your gain just a little bit. Oh, good, good call, Bill. Zoom no, definitely good, does. Thank you. Hopefully Excellent. that's better. Okay, good. good. So we could see these layers uh, differentiate themselves here on the on the hamstrings, kind of common origin. Uh, deep down here, we've got the deeper semimembranosus, semitendinosus overlying that, and laterally at that conjoint structure, we've got our biceps femoris. And we could trace these down and watch the biceps femoris tendon move its way laterally, and its extended muscle belly here. And semitendinosus would be our next landmark, uh, just slightly medial to that, and underneath the um, semitendon or uh, the biceps femoris. Here's our sciatic nerve just as a, a reference. So I'm down at the, the, the gluteal fold again. Um, here we've got semitendinosus. Let's use isotropy to our advantage here. So even though there's a component here, the 
our more superior showing tendon right here medially is our semimembranosus, this little cleft edge. And let's watch it join up with the semitendinosus and then the, the biceps femoris laterally. So you can almost get all three of them in a row, even though there is a conjoined component to it. Uh, here is uh, biceps femoris, semitendinosus, semi membranosis this this little isolated shadow here so i'm just barely rocking the transducer like we do the biceps tendon in the groove to see what subtleties we can get what you don't want to do is get in the habit of calling that a tendinosis even though that's in the name of one of the one of the tendons um that is not a a pathology if you can get it to fill in so anisotropy back here is really helpful but it can also be very misleading and we don't want to call things uh, degenerated if they're not. So now I'm going to take one of these tendons here. In this case, we'll, we'll focus on membranosis and rotate the probe so that the, pro the uh, left side of the screen is facing uh, proximal. So we've got our ischium here. Laterally, it's really nice to see biceps femoris go ahead and shoot off and go do its own thing. And I could follow that, that more laterally oriented structure pretty easily. I'm gonna bring my probe more medial now and focus more on the semi-membranosis and tendinosis area here, which we can see really, really nicely. It looks like a lot of tendons always insert like a big bird's beak. And we see that same pattern back here on another tuberosity in the body on the ischial tuberosity. So we've got our conjoined tendon here superficially and then deep, deep, deep. Down here where, as Bill pointed out, I'm not sure if gain's coming through on Zoom. I'm gonna auto this. Try your TGC deep. Yeah, there we go. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, notice that we're trying to Go there. You go. You're seeing a little bit there, Daniel. Uh, the semimembranosus yeah. deeper, but this is with the give you an idea of how nice the penetration is uh, with the linear 15 to four megahertz transducer. Very true. Most of these higher frequency transducers don't have much of a range to them. And this, you know, we're scanning 15 to four. So it really depends on where we are in the screen, how deep we're trying to shoot, whether I'm in res or gen, and I've dropped my frequency down to the gen spectrum. So I'm on the lower, lower end of that bandwidth, which is really helping me with penetration here. I'm going to move laterally to my sciatic and I'm going to go cross section again, find our ischial tuberosity, check our gain with zoom, which looks a little hot. I'm going to hit auto. Hot. There we go. Auto's doing a really good job. So ischial tuberosity again, here we have our, our sciatic nerve and quadratus femoris just to check our work. And I kind of already went through the sciatic. So I'd, I'd find that to be redundant to trace the sciatic up proximal time on it uh, just a short time ago let's if, just follow like it distally daniel to the upper thigh to you got it yeah so what i'm going to do is add a little bit of gel because i know i know i'm about to follow a track here and um it might even be nice to see it split if if um if i've set the camera to go down there oh very good looks like i did Okay, so quadratus femoris back up here at the ischium. Here we are. And let's follow this structure here, sciatic nerve, distally, distally, distally. Cross section is the way to go. I know that these nerves look really, really pretty in let's long turn, axis. Let's just turn the gain down just a little, Daniel. Thank you, perfect. You bet, it's blinding you. <laughs> okay. So um, sciatic nerve, distally, 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 keep following it distally. And we should start seeing an offshoot here of the uh, common perineal or common fibular nerve, depending on when you went to med school or started learning this. I figured we'd already see it start to bifurcate, but we're not quite there. So here's the popliteal fossa where my hand is. And maybe I missed the bifurcation. It should have already, there it is. 
Okay, so right where my arrow is, you can see the bifurcation take place right there. That's just not separated. Hang on. Oh, that's not right. Because it's going to follow the biceps femoris just as a scanning pearl. Because I sure would not think to see. I think the main thing is, Daniel, let's just go down as far as the Mercedes-Benz sign to show how to identify the conjoined tendon. You're right there. The conjoined tendon more superficial between the biceps femoris and the and the uh, semitendinosus, and then the semimembranosus, that tadpole-shaped structure there to the left, yep, and then the sciatic nerve, so that folks can identify at that level um, where the nerve is and the two tendons in question. That's a very common location for hamstring myotendinous injury. Great point, Bill, and I really like that Mercedes-Benz that's a great thing to put in the slides. I also want to leave a little time for questions if there are any. Um, Now's the time. Yeah, go ahead. If you have any questions, put them into the Q&A box and we will address those. Yeah, this has concluded the normal part of the exam and we're happy to stick around for a few minutes and, and just answer these questions on the fly however you want them to uh, to be addressed if there's something that you'd like reviewed again that we did cover um, and depending on the subject that we didn't cover um, there's also an opportunity to cover a few of those things too but um, I think you know posteriorly Bill orienting to the um, superior sciatic foramen is just it's just the way to go I'm just following the sciatic up long axis which just seem seems to be helping me out quite a bit Good question here, Daniel. Um, ischial bursa, right, as it arcs over the top of the uh, conjoint tendon. That's another one of those bursa that we're really not going to see it unless there's some pathology there. Right. Um, but if you want, if you wanted to see that interface, it, it's not a bad idea to add a little dynamic component to your exam and just kind of roll, um, roll the glute max a little bit by getting the femur to rotate. So you could at least delineate, hey, where does, where do all of these um, connective tissue layers begin and end? And, and the answer to that, sometimes, depending on the patient's body habitus, which we don't have a problem with today, uh, but when you're out in, the, out in the real clinical world, sometimes these tissue interfaces are not so obvious. So what I'm doing is just causing an external rotation by moving the yep. leg and I'm isolating that glute max superficially over the ischial um, tuberosity in, it, in, it, in the hamstrings. And I'd be looking for a bursa right up in that spot. Uh, it's that was similar to what we do with the, with the trochanteric bursa. You know? Absolutely. You know, this is ultrasound. Make it move. You know, static images are not going to help you answer a lot of questions. So anytime you get a chance, you need to make these structures move and oppose each other as frequently as you can. And, and sometimes you're going to expose some additional pathology like adhesions that are not so obvious on a static image. Daniel, one also... other question we had was uh, to uh, revisit the, uh, where, where it's common to see a myotendinous tear um, of the hamstrings. So maybe down, start with the conjoined tendon at uh, the Mercedes Benz uh, sign level and um, sure. just follow that central tendon and that's basically what we're doing is we're following that central tendon there and we're looking right adjacent to it for any change in what is normal echo architecture where the mile where the muscle comes into the tendon right yeah, there this nice mm -hmm. little interface right here And now I'm tendinous. Yep. I've left the myotendinous portion and as you I'm work proximally. Th that's correct. Mm -hmm. So it's a, just that myotendinous location, kind of like what we see with gastroc tears, uh, right up against the tendon. 
and you're looking for fluid defect, you're looking for a change in that normal pennate pattern or starry night appearance if you're short axis to the course of muscle, you're just looking for a change in that uh, what otherwise is a typical echo architectural appearance. Right there, beautiful. See how you follow, see how he's following that down. So anywhere along um, and adjacent to that central tendon is where you're going to see um, changes, uh, appearance change. There you see the uh, semimembranosus tendon deep to it. See that tadpole looking structure there. Mm -hmm. Hope that answers the question. Um, are there any other questions that we have? I'm not seeing any. Laura, I think with that, we'll turn it back over to you. Great. Um, Bill, by any chance, do you have that last slide that you can show? Or oh, do you yes, I, I do. Thank you. Just so everyone knows, we will be posting um, the recordings of all these webinars at this website that you see here, secure.sonosite.com slash behind the skin webinar and look forward to uh, some new webinars posting in January. We'll have a few on, in the MSK market um, on dorsal wrist and carpal tunnel. So I just wanted to let everyone know that those are coming soon. Great. And we wish you all a happy holidays. Absolutely. And thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Bill and Daniel, again, for an exceptional presentation and demonstration. Very well done. Thanks, everybody.